Welcome to another episode of the Learn, Dream, Do Show. Today, we need your help to solve a mystery. Start by being observant. Look around very carefully. Notice everything. Use your critical thinking skills to help us find clues. Are you ready, gumshoes? It was just another day at the library, but today I had moved into a new office. Everything was peachy keen until I slid over to get a pen and my foot struck something unusual. A box! It had a note. On that note there was a picture of a lemon and of a red fish, and it was otherwise totally blank. Put the note aside and looked at the box. It was locked with a giant padlock. No key in sight. This smelled like a mystery, and to solve mysteries, I need my thinking cap. So I went home to put it on. I took out the note to give it a closer look. Upon further inspection, I found hairs. Of an animal? Could this be a clue? A lemon? A fish? Animal hairs? I couldn't puzzle it out on my own, so I made a few calls. Huh. I wonder what this means. Sometimes in a mystery you come across a red herring. Nope, not the fish. A red herring is sometimes intended to divert attention from the real problem or matter at hand. A misleading clue, like a character that seems to have random information or a clue that just doesn't seem relevant. So watch out for those clues that don't seem to fit. They just might be intended to lead you in the wrong direction. Try this. I have a message for you. What, you can't see it? That's because it's a secret message. I'm gonna show you how to make your own secret messages using some paper, cotton swabs, and lemon juice. Here's what you'll need to make your secret message. You'll need juice from a lemon, a white piece of copy paper, a couple of cotton swabs. You'll also need a heat source of some kind that could be an incandescent light bulb or an iron. And of course, you'll need adult supervision when using that heat source. To create our secret message, I'm going to dip my cotton swabs into the lemon juice and I'm going to write my message on the piece of paper. Now that I've written out my message, I'm going to let this dry completely and we'll come back once it's dry. Okay, my page is almost dry. Probably could have let it dry a little bit longer, but I think this will work. Now I'm going to take my iron and I'm going to slowly move it over my secret message to reveal what I said. And there we go, the message didn't quite come out as dark as I was hoping it would, but this is still a fun way to hide secret messages and clues. It seems like the more lemon juice you use, the darker your message will become. My friends had lots of ideas. Maybe the box was full of lemons. Maybe the note had come from the home of a pet lover. They told me that the fish was probably a red herring. But my friend Ian said that maybe the lemon signified a secret code that I could decipher with the application of heat. I gave it a try. I picked a candle that had been burned halfway down and very safely lit it and held the paper over it. I didn't need to get the note anywhere close to the flames. The top of the candle was just fine. And sure enough, a secret message started to appear. I kept at it until I'd hovered every inch of the paper over the flame. I could just make out the words. They said, open me, open me. But this was just one sheet of paper. It seemed that the note still had some secrets to uncover. I grabbed my handy dandy letter opener and looked for an opening. Sure enough, there it was. I got the note open and found a poem. Another clue. To solve the mystery, you'll need to look in a part of the library that's much more than books, where papers and records and photos are stored. It's a primary and secondary treasure hoard. I tried to puzzle it out on my own, but I knew this one would take a little bit more time. 
How many mystery writers does it take to change a light bulb? One to screw it in almost all of the way, and then another to give it a surprising twist at the end. Okay, Super Sleuths, we've been working hard to solve the mystery so far this episode. For more mysteries to solve and stories to read, check out... The Mystery of the Missing Cake by Claudia Bolt is for our younger mystery fans. When Harold the Fox is invited to a costume birthday party, he and his friends come up with fantastic outfits. The party starts off great, but when the birthday boy's cake is stolen during a game played in the dark, everyone is a prime suspect in this mystery picture book. The Chicken Squad by Doreen Cronin Meet the Chicken Squad, Dirt, Sugar, Poppy, and Sweetie. They might be chicks, but they sure aren't chicken, and they're on a mission. In this adventure, it's up to the Chicken Squad to crack a case that just might be out of this world. The 39 Clues The first book in this popular series is called The Maze of Bones. This multi-author series of mysteries takes readers on a wild ride as they follow clues to solve a mystery and win the family fortune. Finding the books in the 39 Clues series can be a mystery all by itself sometimes, but luckily here at the Fort Worth Public Library, you can search by series title, and all of our copies are shelved together and listed under Children's Fiction T430. Encyclopedia Brown Boy Detective by Donald J. Sobel This is the first book in the famous Encyclopedia Brown series. Ten-year-old Leroy, also known as Encyclopedia Brown, is Idaho Neighborhood's star detective. Every night around the dinner table, Encyclopedia helps his dad solve the town's most baffling crimes. Readers will have 10 mysteries to solve in each book. Can you crack the case? Check it out from the library to find out. The Winterborn Home for Vengeance and Valor by Ali Carter An old mansion has been turned into a home for orphans. Main character April lives there, but she's convinced her mother is coming back for her soon. All she has to do is work together with the other kids to unravel the riddle of a missing heir, a creepy legend, and a mysterious key before the only home they've ever known is lost to them forever. Cam Jansen and the Mystery of the Stolen Diamonds by David A. Adler No mystery is too great for super sleuth Cam Jansen and her amazing photographic memory. Cam and her friend Eric are sitting at the mall when the jewelry store is robbed. Cam sees the thief, but the police arrest the wrong person. Now it's up to Cam to catch the real criminal. The Parker Inheritance by Varian Johnson 12-year-old Candace is spending her summer in Lambert, South Carolina in her grandmother's house. She died after being dismissed as city manager for digging up city property. But when Candace finds the letter that sent her grandmother on the treasure hunt, she finds herself caught up in the mystery. Candace and fellow bookworm Brandon set out to find the inheritance, exonerate her grandmother, and expose an injustice committed against an African-American family in Lambert. Pick up these and many other great mysteries on Libby, in person, or put it on hold and get it curbside. If anyone could solve the case of the mysterious box, then it would be the most famous detective in history of fictional books, Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is a British character from a series of books created by writer Arthur Conan Doyle over 130 years ago. Sherlock Holmes uses his education in science and chemistry, along with paying attention to the smallest details to solve mysteries and crimes that aren't quite so elementary. Not only is Holmes famous for his ability to solve crimes, but also for his cool fashion. Sherlock Holmes is often seen in books and movies wearing a deerstalker hat, trench coat, and carrying a pipe. What clues do you think Sherlock Holmes would use to solve the case of the mysterious fox? What do you call an alligator in a vest? An investigator! Raccoons have long been identified as the bandits of the animal world, notoriously taking food from trusting and unsuspecting campers. They even wear masks to hide their identities. But did you know there are many more sneaky critters in the animal kingdom? Our first case today is that of the buff-bellied hummingbird who lives in South Texas. She steals spider web from hard-working, unsuspecting spiders. The buff-bellied hummingbird will even sometimes eat the spider before stealing its silk to make a tiny pillow-soft nest for its minute little eggs. Yet another sneaky collector is the bowerbird, who lives in Australia, 
These artistic thieves collect bright blue objects from water tops, string, paper, crayons, and even children's toys. The male bowerbird uses these items to add some pizzazz to the nest which they are presenting to the female. Not only do these clever birds borrow blue items from us humans, but they often take the best items from other nearby bower's nests. The dung beetle can be found on nearly every continent. They are also notorious for stealing each other's dung balls. What is a dung ball, you ask? A dung ball is animal poo that's been rolled into a nice round ball. Dung beetles use these poo balls to lay their eggs and the newly hatched dung beetle larvae feed on the nutrients in the dung, making these balls a real hot commodity. These unlikely treasures are known to prompt epic battles between male beetles for who gets the poo. This stinky game of keep away makes sure their larvae survive. Another thieving feathered friend is the burrowing owl. If you stake out prairie lands all over North America, including Texas, you might spot the cute and cuddly prairie dogs, who are not dogs at all, but rodents. These sweet little animals make tunnels underground and live in large underground colonies like furry ants enter the burrowing owl. The also very cute but strange burrowing owl is quite lazy and prefers to live in a nice cozy burrow that's already been dug up by a hardworking prairie dog. If the prairie dog does not like this arrangement, the owl will simply eat them. You don't have to travel very far to watch some of our clever burglars and borrowers at work. Your mission is to put bird seed out in bird feeders and sit outside for a bit, just in your backyard. These sneaky critters will start showing their true colors. So I challenge you to draw up the best mugshot of one of these backyard bandits and post it on our Facebook page. Hola a todos, hello everyone. My name is Minerva or Minerva and welcome to Un Minuto en Español our newest segment where you will have an opportunity to learn some cool words in Spanish. Vamos a empezar! Let's begin! My favorite books and movies are the kinds that have you trying to figure out what's going to happen at the end. We call those misterios or mysteries. All the best misterios give you pistas or clues and they can help you solve the mystery. Some misterios have espias or spies, and that's a character that finds out secret information and passes it along to someone else. My favorite misterios are the ones with Nancy Drew. They are so good, but you'll need to read one so that you can learn what happens at the end. What about you? What is your favorite misterio? Now, for all you mystery solving fans, I'm here today to learn about what it is like to work in a forensics lab where scientists use evidence to find out the truth. This is Elizabeth Van, and she's a forensic supervisor at the City of Fort Worth Police Department Crime Lab. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Elizabeth. So your first question for the t today is, for a lot of kids watching this, they might think your job is like a CSI crime solving TV show. How is your job compared to what people see on TV? Um, CSI is a TV show, so you have to remember those type of shows are for entertainment purposes. Um, it's very fast paced, they leave a lot of things out, and, and it's very glamorized for TV. Um, for example, one person goes out and collects all the evidence, and they bring all the evidence back to the crime lab where they work the DNA, the firearms, and the um, toxicology. And almost at the end of the show, they go out and arrest the person. But in reality, we have a um, crime scene investigators that go out and collect evidence and um, photograph the crime scene. And then they collect the evidence and bring it back to the crime lab where we have a team of forensic scientists who actually are the people who's going to analyze the physical evidence. Um, the forensic biology analyzes DNA samples. The firearms examiner analyzes the cartridge cases, the bullets and the firearms. And then the drug chemists are the one who analyze the drugs that are found at the crime scene. And after all our analysis are performed and are completed, and if we have enough evidence, it is the detective who actually goes out and arrests the person. Wow, so it really is a team effort. Yes, ma'am. Great. And so in the, the crime lab, is it true that you use science to solve crime? 
Yes, uh, forensic science is the application of um, science to criminal and um, civil law. And what is happening is that we use disciplines such as physics, chemistry, and biology to help explain what happens at a crime scene. For example, physics is used to describe what happens in a blood spatter. Um, biology sample is used to identify an unknown suspect, and chemistry is used to identify the unknown controlled substance that is found at the crime scene. Wow, so what we learn in school can really be applied. That's awesome. Yes. When you were a kid, did you know that you wanted to go into this profession? Um, when I was a child, I loved math and science, but I also loved to read. Um, my favorite book to read was Charlotte's Web. And when I was done with reading that, I read about spiders, the life of spiders, and how spiders weave the web that they do. Um, I was always curious to learn about why things are the way they are. When I found forensic science as an adult, it matched up to my personality. And it, um, it matched up to my personality because it is doing what I love as a child and what I'm doing now as an adult. That's great. That's awesome when your daily work is enjoyable. Yes. Um, so we have a lot of mystery books at the library. Were you into mystery books as a kid? And if not, what were your favorite kinds of books growing up? I love to read mystery as a child. I, I was never without a Nancy Drew, a Hardy Boys, Agatha Christie, um, Encyclopedia Brown, Sherlock Holmes. But I also like to read um, uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Um, and, and this is before the internet, so I was reading encyclopedias and the almanac. That's so fun. I also really love Ripley's Believe It or Not. It's so fun to be that information sponge. Yes. So what subjects in school would you recommend a kid to take if they wanted to grow up and work in a forensics lab? Well, in order to become a forensic scientist, you have to at least have a bachelor degree in science, in physical science, such as chemistry, physics, biology, biochemistry. I would also suggest taking statistics, mathematics, and writing. Um, my best advice is also to take a class in public speaking um, where your ability to present in front of a jury is very helpful in explaining your work effectively. Wow, I never made that connection. That's really important. So that's something you've done regularly? Yes, uh, I have to go to court to um, give a presentation of, to the jury of my findings. Wow, interesting. That's very important. Um, so what is the most rewarding thing about your job? I believe that my problem solving skills um, translate to real to solving real life mysteries. Um, that my work is part of a whole criminal justice system, and we all work towards um, freeing of the innocent and um, punishment of the guilty. Yeah, using science and facts. That's awesome. Yes. Uh, so, finally, what is your biggest piece of advice for kids today? My best advice is to have an inquisitive mind, always to be learning about something. It doesn't matter what. Uh, focus on that journey of learning. You don't always have to be best or you don't always have to know everything. It's that journey process of learning and you make that into a habit. That is such good piece of advice because it applies to your career or many others as well. That's correct. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth Van, and thank you so much for serving our community. Thank you. Bye. Back in the library, I read the note aloud, hoping that somehow I would hear something I hadn't noticed before. Solve the mystery you'll need to look in a part of the library that's much more than books, where papers and records and photos are stored. It's a primary and secondary treasure hoard. Sounds like you could use the archive. It worked. To the archive! Welcome back, Gumshoes. Let's see how observant you were when we first started this episode. Five things in this room have changed since you saw me in here earlier. Can you spot all five? I'll give you some time to see if you can remember everything correctly. 
Here's the room now. And here was the room before. The things that are different are the tree, the blanket, the picture on the wall, the flower, and the dinosaur skull. Did you get all of them? Noticing details can really pay off whether you're the eyewitness or the mysterious one. Bonus, my magnifying glass was orange before. There are lots of mysteries in the world, like how the pyramids were built and if aliens really exist. But one thing that isn't much of a mystery are the things you can do to help keep yourself safe. It's always a good idea to maintain safety wherever you are. So let's talk about how remembering important information, keeping a friend nearby, and avoiding strangers in public and on the internet can help you be safe. The first thing you can do to maintain your safety is to remember important information like your parents' phone numbers and your home address. A lot of us have cell phones with our parents' numbers saved, but there may be a time where you don't have your cell phone available. You should also learn your address. If you ever call 911, the operator will always ask you for your location. If you have trouble learning your address, just turn it into a song. Friends are awesome, but did you know that they can also be a way to keep you safe? Always keep at least one friend around when you're outside your home and never walk anywhere alone. But if you do have to walk alone, avoid taking shortcuts through alleys and never talk to strangers. Neighborhoods are filled with people who can assist you. People at work like police officers, firemen, store workers, and even a neighbor can help you when you need it. Strangers are also people from the internet. Although they have a profile picture saying that they're a certain person, they could actually be someone else. Never make plans to meet with anyone from the internet and tell your caregiver if someone is asking you to meet with them. Now that you are aware of these safety tips, what other ways can you keep yourself safe? Excuse me, am I in the archives? Yes, you are. I'm looking for a key. I have the key. I had the key at last. I put it into the lock and opened the box. And what I found inside was another mystery. A ball of yarn, a ball, a tiny hedgehog, ribbons on a stick, hey, a red herring, a bell, and cat ID badges? Can you tell me the story behind all this cat stuff? Cat stuff? Not just cat stuff, but library cat stuff. My name's Gabby, and I'm a librarian here at Fort Worth Public Library, and I'm here to talk about cats. Library cats. Did you know that it's not unusual for libraries to have cats? In fact, the White Settlement Public Library has a cat named Browser. But Fort Worth has its own history with cats, two of them as a matter of fact. Back in 1986, the staff at the central branch of the Fort Worth Public Library adopted two kittens, an orange tabby and a brown tabby. They called one of them Dewey and they called the other one Desi. In case you didn't know, the way libraries often organize their books is the Dewey Decimal System. And if there's anything worse than a dad joke, it's a librarian joke. Back in the 1980s, the central branch of the public library had a huge problem with mice and rats. Sometimes people would open up their office doors and find rats playing on the floor, and one person had their lunch eaten before they even got to get at it. So the library decided to do something about it, and they adopted these two kittens. The kittens were so important to the library that they even got their own City of Fort Worth employee ID cards with their cat faces and their little cat paws on the cards. So during the week, the cats would run around behind the scenes and they'd be looking out for mice and for rodents and rats. And unsurprisingly, a few months after the cats started patrolling the hallways behind the scenes, there were no more rats or mice. The cats sometimes also got inter-office mail and people would send them coupons for cat food and cat litter, which was probably pretty important to the human librarians that were taking care of these cats. 
So I found this article in our archives back when they first got adopted. Although it looks like they spent their days walking over the books in the library, it was a rare day when they got to visit with the public. And this is why we have this awesome sign that reminds people not to let the cats into the public areas. You too can solve other Fort Worth history mysteries by visiting the central branch of the Fort Worth Public Library. Thanks for joining us today and we hope you enjoyed today's mystery. Having fun doesn't have to be a mystery after the episode ends, however. Check out these resources to hone your detective skills. Check out one of the I Spy books from Jean Marzello using either in-person or curbside pickup. This series of books lets you put your observation skills to the test as you search for items hidden in the pages. Want to take your detective skills out on the street? Try geocaching. Geocaching is a real-world, outdoor treasure hunting game using GPS-enabled devices. Use your smartphone or other GPS-enabled device to navigate to a specific set of GPS coordinates and attempt to find the geocache container hidden at that location. You can also visit their website to learn how to get started by going to geocaching.com guide. I remember watching Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego and Where on Earth is Carmen Sandiego as a kid. The Carmen Sandiego universe got a reboot in 2019, putting a new twist on this show. Join the adventures of Carmen Sandiego, a globe-hopping master thief, by checking out the show on Netflix and the official website, CarmenSandiego.com. There are many dangers that lurk on the internet, and you need to use your sleuthing skills to keep you safe. Check out the free resource from the Federal Bureau of Investigations, or FBI, and play the safe online surfing game. Check it out at sos.fbi.gov. Did you know that everyone's fingerprints are different? Become a fingerprint detective using this free Scholastics activity on their website and find out if your fingerprints are loop, whirl, arch, or a combination of all three. Visit the URL listed on your screen to learn more. A photo scavenger hunt is a great way to spend an afternoon. The goal is to bring back digital photos of various places and things from a list. It's a great way to capture fun memories and also makes for a fun icebreaker activity. There are a lot of pre-made lists available online, but you can always make up your own for your friends. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time.